Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to the marsh tonight. And by the marsh, I mean my living room and the homes of the performers you're going to see here tonight. Um, we've been getting together on Zoom and um, exploring new materials. So what you're going to see here tonight did not exist a couple of months ago. Uh, so that's a little bit of a, a miracle of, of modern life. Um, so um, without, uh, oh, I do want to mention to the performers that um, after this, we will, uh, there'll be, you'll get a, a breakout group notification so join us there um and without further ado i want to introduce our first performer lily servere opening the slider door feels heavier than usual Mid-September and hot as fuck in the San Fernando Valley, an armpit of LA if you ask me. This 98 degree heat outside met by this ugh, 80 degree stuffy air inside the house. <clears throat> Quiet, but the tension is thick. I head to the familiar bedroom, a bit of a time capsule. A mattress from the 70s, hard as a rock. These plain white walls, a white crochet blanket with a knotted texture, and this painting of a little girl at a piano who I always imagined was me. This was my grandmother's room, Inez. Having hers as my middle name gives me a sense of pride. I, I feel protective of this space, territorial about wanting to be closer to her. She's been gone a decade, but I, I can still sense her here. Everything's changing, but at least this room has stayed the same. Heading to the living room, it's pretty nondescript. TV, coffee table, love seat, couch, but it wouldn't matter if this space was beautifully decorated. You can't avoid the face of death in the room. This big hospital bed takes up the space where his bed, his recliner used to be, his main spot. Oh my God, he looks so small. Mouth open, eyes closed, breathing audibly. His expression somewhere between confusion and discomfort. I was only here a few weeks ago and sure he was declining then, but now he's turned into something I don't recognize. I wanna leave, I wanna turn on the fucking AC. Say you're here, Lily. My dad looks at me, his eyes tearing up behind his glasses. He looks, Relieved that I'm here and equally ready for a beer. Dad, who used to intimidate me, who I felt disconnected from. He keeps a tough exterior, but really he's a sensitive man. Hi, Grandpa. No response. What did I expect? Hijo mano, hi, Lily. That's what I had hoped for. A wide toothy grin, a wheezing kind of cackle and a watery nostalgic eye. My grandfather made his favoritism clear. There's this cabinet in his living room that's nothing special at a glance until you look closer and see all these photos of me. Me at the beach, high school and elementary photos, college graduation, me on his lap as a toddler. It's a fucking Lily Shrine. I'm the youngest of 13 grandkids, but you would never know it looking at this display. It's always made me feel special and love, but a little guilty. I imagine my brother sneering at it from the sidelines. It's not all about you, Lily. Lump in my throat, face flush. How fun? 
fucking dare you say it's not all about me when your shit show of life is sucking all the air out of the room. In recent years, I've entrusted my mom with my frustrations about my brother. You know, Bubba loves you very much, but he also loves to tease you, get a rise out of you, just like your dad. Yeah, but I'm so over this toxic masculinity machismo bullshit. I want to be able to talk to him like we're adults. Well, I wouldn't say the toxic masculinity part if I were you. That won't go over well. This is how you have been for years. Passive aggressiveness, uncalled for teasing, leading with your insecurities. How do you think it makes me feel uh, that I feel unsafe with my only sibling? My brother and I shared a room up until he was in high school. Poor guy sharing a space with his eight-year-old sister. His side was a deep ox blood and mine a honey mustard, light and dark, like our skin colors and our temperaments. My parents would always say, oh, Bubba would cry and be you know, whiny when we wake him up from a car ride. And then we'd wake Lily up and she'd be smiling and happy. So as I'm sweating on this hot September day, staring at this cabinet of photos, it hits me. No man has ever loved me this much. Adored me so deeply for reasons I don't know and that I will never know. And yet my grandfather didn't really know me, you know? You know, when you just latch onto someone and you can't quite explain it, Growing up, he and my grandmother would have weekly dinners with us. And he'd say, okay, Lily, go ahead and talk over old times with your grandma over there. And she'd ask, Lily, how's school? Mm -hmm. And what about soccer? Oh, that's so nice. Talk over old times was my grandfather's version of shooting the breeze. He'd tell the same stories over and over again with his group of guys that were all 10 to 20 years younger than him. And they talk in these coded nicknames. Yet as a kid, I was sometimes bored by them. Why do we have to have dinner with grandma and grandpa? I whined to my dad, because we're gonna die someday. So I learned to never complain over talking over old times again. My grandfather, he always had this air of mischief about him, even during our last visit about three months before his death. He wheels slowly past me towards the kitchen. Let's see what we can get into. Barely able to walk, he wheeled up with his roller walker to the fridge, peered in, and stepped aside a little bit. I'm anxiously on the sidelines, but I don't dare if he asks help because he hates that shit. He looks in and gets a tomato, three boxes of styrofoam containers with expired food, and a coronita, his favorite. Okay, so I'm going to go sit over here and we're going to ignore each other. And then I'll tell you when I'm ready and you can start bringing the things over. So he wheels on over to the table, gets situated, and starts sweetly bossing me around like I'm his waitress. Okay, go ahead and start making the eggs. All right, how would you like them? However you do is fine. Okay, good. Now make sure to get the rice and beans hot, but not too hot. Uh-huh. And oh, sprinkle some salsa. There, there. Mm, good. Thank you. Okay, here are your eggs. Uh, are they okay? That's good. Thank you, Lily. Oh, can you bring me some nopales too? This guy was 100 years old at this point, just a few weeks shy of 101. He fought in World War II and had a Purple Heart. Didn't take any medications. He'd make his rounds in the morning for three breakfasts at restaurants, all before 8 a.m. 
he didn't quite understand technology, but he spoke passionately about wanting to invent some kind of collar um, to help us understand dogs' barks so we could better be with them. He lived by himself for 10 years since my grandmother died. And he was driving still through most of his 100th year. And he was a Libra like me, me a 10-9, him a 10-10. I can't eat when Mike's here. He's always watching me. My uncle Mike forces my grandfather to eat because he doesn't have his regular appetite, a common sign of the dying process. He needs an IV so he's at least getting some kind of nutrition, this uncle says. Just look at him. He's strong. He's healthy. Maybe he can go into an independent living facility, says another. These guys are way beyond denial. They are delusional. So I play the social worker card. Look, grandpa is dying. We need hospice to come in. No, nah, I really think he's just dehydrated. And we could get him an oxygen machine. My Nina had one of those and it really helped her. This interaction is way above my pay grade. In that September heat wave, my brother and dad are running the show. Hospice does come in, but that isn't without shit talking, cheese me, saying we do a better job than them. I mean, we're lifting him, holding him as he winces, changing his diaper. It takes at least three of us to maneuver him. At one point, I get the task of wiping his ass. What are these marks on grandpa? I asked my dad and brother, pointing to these lines right above my grandfather's hips. And my dad says, oh, well, we use a Sharpie to mark where his diaper should sit. Oh my God, poor grandpa. Poor grandpa, what about us? And he takes out a Sharpie, starts drawing a face on my grandfather's button and makes it talk. Ooh, hello. Meanwhile, my brother replies, wow, dad, grandpa's not even dead yet and you're drawing on him. Stop, it's all funny games to you. Grief takes a different form in all of us. Later, my dad asked me, did you see the scooter? I recommend taking it for a ride. You've been riding it in the house, isn't it kind of big? Nah, I just take it for a lap. It really calms me. So my, while my dad whizzes by on the scooter, like the kind you'd see at Walmart, my brother is all business cleaning up. Yeah, go ahead and just keep playing, dad. It's not like grandpa's dying or anything. I'll just keep doing the work. Those skin and bones, my grandfather's body still has definition, strength. He pushes back on us with his weight. I wanna walk. Dad, we can't let you do that. You gotta stay here. Defeat and the awareness of his dying so clear on his face. His closed eyes make it that much more haunting. And then he starts speaking in Spanish and he's calling to friends and family who have since passed. Mama, Papa. My great grandfather was in a fatal accident and collided with a train when my grandpa was six years old. So he grew up believing that it was his fault that his dad was rushing home to take care of him when he got hit by the train. My mom did some investigating and confirmed that the timelines didn't match up. It wasn't his fault. At 95, he finally got to release decades of burden. Grandpa would talk about this pain in his chest, kind of a tightness, say he was feeling nervous. I see the, these as imprint of daddy issues, these pangs of sorrow and fear that are passed down through three generations. Dad, do you want to go be with mom? Kill me, kill me, kill me. No, dad, we're not going to do that. And my dad rests his hand right on that belly button face. He likes it like this. 
he tells me as he's making circular motions on my grandfather's stomach. I'm going to take care of you, dad. I'm going to make you real comfortable. I examine my dad's face, always seeing my grandmother and his features, their, their long, wide nose. Their voice sounds the same too. And so I scan for signs of myself in him. His brown eyes blinking impatiently at me. My mind floats back to childhood, being at the kitchen table with him, 20 or so dried pinto beans in front of us. It's kind of hilarious, my Mexican father using beans to try to teach me basic math, but the racial stereotype is lost on me because I'm on the brink of tears. I've dissociated, everything feels really fuzzy. Do you get it? He asks. Okay, so 12 times 13, two and three is five. No, wait, wait, six. Okay, so crisscross applesauce, I don't know. Come on, are you even listening? Meanwhile, my mom is at the kitchen saying, sorry, I can't help you. Thanks for the garbage math skills, mom. You know, you look just like your mother, they say. My dad with his black hair, thin but muscular frame and brown, like the shade of coffee with creamer in it. My mom, uh, you know, pale, red hair, a gringa. And my brother, fully Mexican with a full head of thick black hair. And me, I like to call myself Latina incognita. You have grandpa's eyes. My mom says to me, and a flutter of pride bursts from my heart. Everyone has their take on who I look like. All my life, I've been looking for signs of belonging. When I was nine, I remember having this fit, insisting I must be adopted. I don't look like any of you. Lily, that's you coming out of me. As she shows me a picture of her C-section, my little pink head sticking out of her. So I'm back to my previous trip with my grandfather, our last intact time together. We're sitting in silence. He's in his recliner and I'm at a nearby red couch. And all of a sudden he slowly starts to stand up. One foot at a time. And I see him reach behind and get the pillows and put on his roller walker. And then I realize he's coming towards me. This means I'm in. I'm in the Tony Severa VIP lounge. Given just a little bit of mystery, a man keeping me on a hook with these moments of affection, reminding me I'm special, displaying his love for me in a shrine of photos. My heart is so touched by him. And it's also thumping out of my chest. I'm, I'm shaking. I have this big lump in my throat. Rage boils inside me as I read these incoming text messages from my brother. Look, you're clearly trying to run the show. So just do whatever you want and we'll be here like we always are at your beck and call. Okay, well, I tried to coordinate ahead of time and figure out what might be good for you. Maybe it's best if I don't come by then. You also tried to dictate my behavior ahead of time. So good times. You said you had other plans, but weren't sure of timing, making me both incapable of being respectful of your time and figuring out what we could do as a family. If you don't show up, that's on you. In the span of my grandfather coming over, I realized I need to leave. 
I'm scared to make things worse with my brother. Every fiber in me wanted to stay there on that couch and soak in that tender moment. But I let obligate, obligation take over me. Grandpa, I'm gonna go see Bubba. I'll be back later. Don't you worry about me, Lily. You go do your thing. I'll be here. It is a truth universally acknowledged that an American woman exchanging Tinder messages with an English man will, upon hearing his accent, go to great lengths to get him to fuck her, which is why I'm at an Airbnb in London. This rationale for being in London did not impress my esthetician at a Knightsbridge salon earlier today. What is it with Yanks and romanticizing the UK? You live in San Francisco. This salon is not posher because it's located in London. Yes, it is. This Brazilian is not posher because I have an English accent. I'm pretty sure it is. Your man is not posher because he has a London accent. Yes, huh? Rami and I matched on Tinder while he was on holiday in San Francisco two months ago. But somewhere in between when we matched and when we started messaging, I flew to New York. And I let him know I'd be boarding a transatlantic cruise a couple of days later. He told me he'd be leaving us at for Vegas. But based on my anticipated date of return, Rami proposed that we meet in an airport hotel during his layover at SFO on his way home to London. He apologized that he wasn't offering a first date I was worthy of, but I'm on Tinder to get laid. So if I hadn't missed my flight home from Paris, I would have been all over that shit. As it stands, we've never met, but we've been in almost daily contact ever since. When considered from an I'm on Tinder to get laid perspective, every aspect of this love story following the moment Rami and I matched feels protracted as fuck, but Pride and Prejudice is my favorite novel of all time. So per the standards of that turn of the 19th century classic romance, our trajectory is pretty standard, potentially speedy even. Two months? How many fortnights is that? Four, maybe five? And how long does it take to get from Longbourn to Brighton? by buggy, certainly longer than my nine hour flight because you have to like stop and change horses and shit. <laughs> so this love story is right on a schedule and delightfully fraught with all of the requisite anticipation. Rami primarily sends me voice notes because he considers video communication of any kind to be a firm boundary for reasons that include that he isn't enamored with how he looks on the screen. Fair enough. And I respond with video messages because I am totally enamored with how I appear on screen. 
he starts every message with a string of compliments based on the content of my preceding video. And I start every message by positively and re re positively reinforcing that excellent behavior. My favorite compliments. One. Be in no doubt that you've already far exceeded my expectations. Two. I just know whatever you're going to say is going to turn me on. Three. You never disappoint. I will. We get to know each other and marvel at our uncommon connection. I tell him that I identify as solo polyamorous, that I'm not looking for a primary partner, and I intend to spend the rest of my life cultivating as many sexually fulfilling relationships as possible. He tells me that he ultimately wants to settle down in monogamous marriage and have children, but that for the time being, currently spends most of his free time at sex clubs and sex parties fucking his way across Europe and the rest of the world. I tell him I also identify as a fuck pillow and enjoy being used for other people's pleasure. He responds, we sound quite sexually compatible. I would love fucking the shit out of you. Like there's just no doubt. And I would ensure that you have to put in minimal effort. Those are the words that my fuck pillow dreams are made of and hearing them in his voice with that accent that sounds nothing like what I was just trying to approximate. I promptly bought a ticket to London. Rami asks four questions in response to hearing the dates I'll be in London. Number one. Do you have any requests for the time we'll be spending together? I do. Remember that shit you said about a first date I, I was worthy of? I want to know what that is. What do you mean by that? Whatever that is, that's what I want. Number two. His number two ask includes new to me information. I will be flying in on his birthday. Can I expect a birthday blowjob? Why, yes. Yes, you can. Number three, ask, will you let me take you to a sex club? Hmm, yeah, no. I've had reason to think about this and strongly feel that in order for me to be comfortable at a sex club with someone who I am romantically or sexually attracted to, I would need to have all of their attention all of the time. And because this seems like an absurd request to make of somebody who loves group sex within a sex club context, just seems like I'm probably not your girl. We're all good. We have many other things to do. Romy's fourth ask comes with a preamble. He tells me that he is very much looking forward to spending as much time as possible with me during the first half of my stay in London, but perhaps unfortunately, he will be in the south of France for the second half of my stay. And here he says, here's where it gets interesting. For whom? And in what way? Is all of this only now going to get interesting. Rami continues. He informs me that while in France, he'll be staying in Cap Dog, the largest nudist colony turned swinger sex village in the world. By day, he tells me Cap Dog maintains the same appeal it did when it was simply the world's largest nudist colony with nude beaches, nude restaurants, nude supermarkets, etc. But since the arrival of swingers, now people are also openly having sex everywhere they go during the day. And where the swingers go, the sex spas, sex bars, and sex clubs will follow. These sex establishments, Rami tells me, all really come alive at night. 
He suggests that everyone who is sexually liberated should go and see Cap Dog at least once in their lifetime. His fourth ask, would you care to join me? I politely and somewhat regretfully decline. I mean, I recognize a once in a lifetime offer when I hear one. But if I'm not comfortable going to a sex club with Rami for a couple of hours, it seems inadvisable to accompany him on a vacation in another country to an entire sex village for any length of time. Also, it may appear that we've outstripped the usefulness of Jane Austen as reference for how to proceed. But keep in mind that Rami and I have still never met. And at no point while I was soaking in the delicious anticipation of a novel that takes hundreds of pages to culminate in a first kiss, did I think to myself, you know what this book is missing? Sex clubs. My love story with Rami was unconventional enough when it was just about two sluts on Tinder who instead of having a one night stand like normal people, decided to become glorified pen pals instead. This story is enough if it ends with Rami and I meeting for the first time, falling into each other's arms, our lips touching for the first time, validating the mutual chemistry we hoped would translate from thousands of miles away, but it doesn't. The chemistry part happened. That's on track, but that's not where this story ends. Because I just got back from a sex club in London. <laughs> it's report card day and my neighbor mrs allen is driving carpool well let's see looks like again my girls hit it again b minus c's that's my girls what about you nancy what kind of grades did you get um, I, I got all A's this time. Oh, are you sure, Nancy? You know, you can't stretch a tail sometimes. Are you sure? Yeah. The minute that car stops, I push out the door and say, bye, Diane, see you tomorrow. And I rush to the next door neighbors, who I know don't get home until almost six o'clock. So I throw myself on their porch and I go, I'm always like Mrs. Allen, and I thought she liked me, but she tells me I'm lying. She didn't believe me. I did get all right. I did get all right. I know I did, but why doesn't she believe me? I know I can't be gone too long, or mommy will call her. So I go to their pool, and I put water on my face, and try to puff up my little fat puffy cheeks, and when I feel like I look normal, I go home and I take all my A's, which make mommy happy. A couple months later, it's March, and mommy is not happy. She gets the box of all her dead parents' things out of the closet, and mostly she holds their death cards. My daddy, my daddy died when I was just 18 months old, Nancy. And and then my mom was all by herself and and I stayed and helped her on the farm till I was 13 and not like you haven't Nancy I had to go into town to go to high school and live with a family and I worked hard to I iron shirts and I had to take care of the kids just so I could stay there but then a neighbor brought me home on the weekend so I could see mama 
And she started to say, Leela, do you have blood in your stool? Well, no, mama, I don't. A couple months and Aunt Pauline took her to the hospital and I never saw her again, Nancy. She died when I was 14 years old. Well, mom, I'm 12 and I don't think I've ever heard a happy story. We always cry when we look at all this stuff. Their picture, their wedding picture is beautiful, mom. I love looking at it. Short lives, but they had to have something happy happen, mom. Tell me a happy story, not all these tears. Well, daddy did have a book and I named Leela because their favorite book was The Prophet by Omar Khayyam. Not many Nebraska girls in my era were named Leela. They were all Ruth and James. But mom kept that book and she had other books and she liked her garden, Nancy. We, we were out in her garden. I loved to be out there with her. And, and, and she taught me to sew. That, that's, why I, that's why I can sew and why I can make dresses for you. And we had big picnics. You know, you like those picnics, but they were better than they are now because there were more people there. There were more people. Mom, you're trying to sound happy, but you're still crying. I, I don't get it. I'm sorry, Nancy. I, I try, but I wish I'd had a daddy like you still have a daddy at 12. And I miss my mama. I can't help it. She was so good. And she might help me understand. I never yelled at my mama the way you yell at me. And I almost died when you were born. I just wish you could be a little more grateful like I was and not get so stubborn and so mad at me. I obviously hear my mother's pain and I don't want to make it any worse, but I can't help it. I want my way sometimes. So now I have my eyes set on 12, a couple more months and be 12. And I'm going to be more free. I have decided that. But no, two days before I'm 12, I get the monthly visitor. And it's not sweet and pink like those stupid films they showed us. And the pad, it's a pain. And I can't go out. I know people will see it. And I have brand new underwear, and now it has blood on it, that awful blood. This is terrible. So I'm not free. I'm locked in the bathroom to be near the toilet. I just hurt so much. Nancy, Pauline is here for your birthday. She brought all the ingredients, your favorite coconut cake. Come out. We'll make the cake for your dad when he comes home, and we'll have your birthday cake. I'm not coming out. Don't you get it? I don't feel good. And I want to be by myself. I don't want to be with your friends today. I want to be alone. Leave me alone. Nancy, Nancy, calm down. If you just come out, I'll give you some, some aspirin. I think you'll feel better if I give you some aspirin. No, go the hell away. Leave me alone. Well, Leela May, are you going to let her talk to you that way? I would never talk to my mama that way. And I doubt if you talk to your mama that way. And if I had a daughter, she would never talk to me like that. That is just not the way of Jesus. And I know the teens at my church don't talk that way. And I'm just worried. I'm sorry. If you take her to that private girls' school you're taking her to, she will get nothing but brattier. I do not appreciate you calling Nancy bratty. She's had her first period, and I doubt if you can remember that, but it's not fun. It wasn't fun, and she doesn't feel good. And you have no idea what it is to be have a child, and I don't think you're going to. So I don't appreciate your advice on how to have a teenager. Well, I just won't say to be insulted like this, but... I'm leaving this book. And I think it'd be good for you and Paul to read it because I don't think you're making Nancy walk with Jesus and that's part of this problem. I hear the door slam just as there's a thud on the carpet. I'm in a hot bath by now and 
it's feeling a little bit better. I hear the mixer out in the kitchen. So I'm thinking maybe there'll be something okay on this 12th birthday. Good coconut cake and solitude in this bathtub. Four months later is the big event of being 12. I go to the private girls' school. And my dad drives me to school. For anybody who's watched the Rose Parade, you go south on Orange Grove, where the parade always starts. At the Ridley Mansion, yes, chewing gum. Now, not all the mansions are quite as big as that one, but there's some huge houses. I just don't know about this, Nancy. I'm very worried. My dad had a gardening business and I'd help him. And we'd go to these houses and lots of these girls went to Westridge, some with our chauffeurs and the maids were there when they came home. And I just am worried how poor you're gonna feel with all this, these rich people around you. I don't think it's a good idea, but your mom didn't listen to me. Poor? Dad, I don't get it. I've always been the richest one in school and in the neighborhood. What's poor? You don't understand, Nancy. That is just because you're an only child. And we don't have to spread the money as far. But we are not rich. And I'm worried how you'll feel when you really find that out at this school. Only thing that bothers me about this school, Dad, is that there won't be any boys. And they have to wear these terrible, heavy saddle oxperts in this uniform. Three weeks later. I am asked to attend a new students group. Asked in 1962 means you better do it. And I know that the most notable new student in this group will be Sarah Jane McNabb. Beautiful black girl, two years older than I in the sophomore year. And she's the only black girl in all this 140, some of us white people. I know she'll be there. And I get there my usual on the edge of late and there's Sarah Jane at the end of the row. Nobody around her. So I push in front of a couple of people at the opposite end of her row and I sit right next to her and smile. And our principal, Miss Edmondson says, I want to welcome all of you to come and we want to hear what you like about the school, and if this is a better school than, than the one you went to last year, what you like better of every school. And we want to hear, so you just let us know if there's anything we can do to make it better for you. Sarah Jane speaks first. I have met a lot of nice people, I can tell you that, but some of you would think the way I stand out dark among all you white girls, that that would be my main discontent. But no, my complaint is I had to leave Muir High School, one of the best schools, I think, in the whole state, maybe the country. There's all kinds of things going on. All sorts of art programs, painting and woodworking and metalworking and and five, six music groups, not just the one little glee club that we have here and lots better sports, and they're more interesting because there's boys involved. I really miss your high school, I'll tell you. Well then, Sarah Jane, what are you doing here? Alyssa, I'll tell you straight out. I'm here because my father is a minister in this community, and he's part of a community action group that Miss Edmondson is part of also. And they have talked and he decided that this town is just too divided with all the races that we have and that the richer the groups get, the more divided they seem to be. And that we need to have blacks mixed with whites and that we get to know each other. So I'll tell you straight out, Alyssa, I'm here to help you get integrated. Well, I bet that's the word that that minister at our, well, at our Paul Saints Church says too. So. I just bet that he's part of that group too. And he's driving away all the rich white people that support that church. So I don't know what he's going to do then. Alyssa, I think we better just stay with 
what we're talking about here. And we don't need to bring up all these problems not in the community, not right now, Alyssa. Well, I think you all brought them up, Miss Edmondson, by integrating us. My grandmother and my great grandmother and all my aunts went here and they did just fine when it was all white girls. I got to tell you that, Miss Edmondson. Thank you, Miss We have your opinion now and we better hear some other people now. I decide I need to answer that. Alyssa, my dad went to New York school also, and he liked it just as much as Sarah Jane did. And he lived in a mixed community up toward Washington Boulevard, probably not near your neighborhood. And his sister did not go to Westbridge. They couldn't have afforded it. They were working class, Alyssa. And there were people who were black and white, Japanese and Asian, Chinese, and they all got along, my dad tells me, because they were all working together to make it work. I live in Glendale, and it's not like that at all. So I was hoping it would still be like that here in Pasadena. But now I hear from Miss Edmondson and Sarah Jane that, you know, you got problems here too. I don't get it. When a few more people talk, and and Miss Edmondson dismisses, dismisses the group. And Sarah Jane and I walk out together and I say, well, I sir put it out there that I'm so poor my aunt couldn't have gone to school here. And she says, I think we're both here to tell some truth, Nancy. That's what integration is about. And we talk a little more. We figure out our fathers were both born in 1918 and so probably knew each other in Europe. Well, Nancy, I got to tell you, my father and our church, we have this great youth group on Saturday, Sunday night at seven. Becky, you know, that other girl who's part of this new group, she comes too. So tell your dad and he could come and he could, everybody could meet. It would be fun. I meet dad at the door that night. Dad, I got to tell you some exciting news. You know, the, the new black girl in my class, Sarah Jane McNabb. Well, her dad went to Muir. You probably knew him. We figured out you both were born in 1918. Well, James McNabb, I'll just have to get my yearbook out. I think I know where it is here in the closet. And that'd be fun. I'd like to see him again. Yeah. I kind of think I remember him from PCC too. So now we'll go to that youth group. That'll be fun. No, Paul, it won't be fun. I want to tell you, it won't be fun at all. And I will not be part of it. Like George Wallace and all those smart people of the South know, you've got to keep Negroes in their place or you're going to have trouble. And we don't need trouble for Nancy. Damn it, Leela, if you mention that bigot one more time in this house, he is an asshole. And you better listen to what my experience was in Pasadena and what other people's was. I don't want Nancy to hear anything about that bigotry. It's time to move on, Leela. Well, tell me, does that mean you want her to have a black boyfriend? Leela, you're always jumping ahead to problems. We're talking about going to a youth group. We are not talking about boyfriends. Well, Paul, it is what will happen. I will have no part of it. Sadly, she changed her mind on that. And went along. But when we get there, it's okay because Dad and James McNabb are really happy to see each other and they have a great time talking. And Dad knows Sarah Jane's mother, Ella, too, and they're all talking. And Mom is like, Dad, it's nice to meet you. They all go sitting about the fourth row, and I go up in the front with the kids because they are running the service. I can't sing at all, but Becky can sing, and Sarah Jane has a beautiful voice. So I'm just kind of lip singing and enjoying it and going along. And when the service is over, Sarah Jane comes up to me and with this handsome young man, and she says, Nancy, I want you to meet my brother, Justin. Well, Nancy, it's very nice to meet you. Sarah Jane says, that you're a smart girl and that you know what's going on in the world and in this town. We're standing to demonstrate at Muir School on Saturday about the Vietnam War 
and we would like it if you joined us. Well, that's nice. Thank you, Justin. And I'll have to talk to my parents to see if they could give me a ride. Well, Nancy, if they can't give you a ride, I would be very happy to come and pick you up. I'm thinking, boy, would I like that. But I just say, thank you, Justin. But I'll just have to talk to my parents and see how the Saturday is going. And of course, I go to Sarah Jane the next day and say that it's not going to work. But meanwhile, and go into the youth group, I hear that they're going to do a play for the church and for the community. And I manage to get there with Becky and her mother, so I don't have to tell my mom. And they like my audition. And Sarah Jane comes and tells me the part that they're going to offer, and it's a great part. I meet Dad at the door and say, Dad, guess what? I have the best part in this play. I am so excited. I haven't acted since I was like, what, sixth grade? I'm so excited, Dad. You yes, see, that is fabulous. This will be so much fun for you. We've taken you to plays and you love theater. It won't be great at all, Paul. It won't be great. It won't happen. I won't have it. Well, yeah, I think we should talk about it. I think this would be a good opportunity for Nancy. And you've got to get your fears out of the way. I'm not going to, Paul, because it's I can't be driving her either. I don't have time. Well, I know, Mom, I could get rides with, with Becky's mom or some other parents. No. Dad, please talk to her. I want to do this. You've got to talk to her. You've got to make her say yes, Dad. Nancy, we'll talk about it later. Let's just calm down. Have a nice dinner. We'll talk about it later. Their talk is a very loud fight. I don't have to open the bedroom door at all to hear everything. Mostly, they repeat their same positions. I won't have it, Paul. This is just not a good thing. That neighborhood is not a place for Nancy to be that many times a week. And you know that there would be a black boyfriend come out of it. Leela, you're always jumping to conclusions and to more problems that we don't have. The only problem now is getting Nancy to that play so she can be on stage and enjoy what she likes to do. We gotta let her go, Leela. When are you gonna see that? She can't be under your thumb her whole life. Well, right now she can be, Paul, because I'm not going to have her go there. Bless his heart. I know, Dad. But I also know that tomorrow morning I'll have to hear those words that I hate. You should be lucky, Nancy. Your mother cares about you. You've got to remember that. And she loves you a lot. And you've got to be thankful for that. And I know that when you get old, you're going to appreciate it. Don't all kids hate that line? No, I'm not going to appreciate it when I'm old. I don't want it. Why do you? I don't want to be cared about. I don't even want to be. I don't want to be cared about at all. It's too much trouble. I want to do what I want to do. I want to go to the neighborhoods I want and have the friends I want. I don't care what color their skin is. And I want to be up on that stage. I want to be in that play. I don't want to be with Justin and all the other boys and the kids. I hate a girl's school and I want to be with everybody in that group. <laughs> oh. And I want to stand in front of your high school and protest this stupid damn war with friends that I choose. Hey, Nancy. In fact, God has a plan for each and every one of you in this room. It is rich and it is powerful. It is beautiful beyond belief. But do you know who else God had a plan for? 
Esau. We're in the gymnasium on a Wednesday night. I'm in high school now. The ebb and flow of repentance and backsliding are such that I'm currently right with God, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. Esau had what's called a birthright. He was the firstborn. He was entitled to a double portion of his father's estate. He had rights, and he had privileges that could not be taken away. But they could be given away. And that is exactly what Esau did. He traded his birthright away for a cup of stew. Our pastor, Jason, is now the high school pastor, almost like he graduated from middle school along with us. He's 26, married to this lovely woman named Lynette, who he'd eventually divorce around the time he left the church in his 40s. But for now, he's in charge of the spiritual development of teenagers. He gave it all up for a cup of stew. And like Esau, God has the plan for your life. He wants to give you a double portion of his blessing. And like Esau, you'll be tempted to give it up. Maybe you're already being tempted, tempted to reject the blessings of a lifetime to reject God's perfect will for your life for the pleasures of a moment. Jason talked a lot about finding God's perfect will for our lives. It's basically all the blessings that God wants to give you, but there's this catch. You have to find and stay on this very narrow path that God wants for your life. And if you fall off the path, you fall into God's permissive will which basically represents the things he will do to try to fix your life if and when you fuck it up. It's basically like a shitty consolation prize. And this concept of avoiding sin and finding the perfect will of God already loomed quite large for me as this naturally anxious kid. I remember obsessing over this time I lied to my fifth grade teacher, my nemesis, Scott McGrew, tattled on me for saying shit when I crashed my bike. But Miss Beaner, I said shoot. I just, I have this candy in my mouth uh, and it sounded like the other word, the F word. She believed me and I lost sleep for months, convinced I was either going to hell or the rapture would happen. My family would go up to the sky and I would be left behind. So I was already more than just a little bit anxious about all this stuff. And then we got a little older and they added on maintaining one's sexual purity as a big part of finding, protecting and fulfilling God's perfect will for your life. So I came of age during the advent of the True Love Waits movement. If you're not already familiar, it's this organization with an unhealthy, focus on maintaining the virginity of teenagers. We had banquets and we signed pledges. We were given rings or necklaces or other tokens of purity. And then depending on your specific geography, you might even attend a purity ball where you pledge your virginity directly to your daddy, who would then pass it on to your eventual spouse. It was pretty fucked up. Just think of your virginity like a shoe. <laughs> okay, I know it sounds silly, but think of it like this beautiful satin shoe that's just encrusted with crystals. It's the kind of shoe you might want to wear to your wedding someday. Shoes fit for a princess. Jason's wife, Lynette, was speaking to the girls in the chapel about keeping our shoe vaginas free from foot penises. Uh, while well, he, while well, Jason talked to the boys in the next room about the perils of masturbation, which include impotency. And they never actually talked to the girls about masturbating, but I inferred it was a no-no. I would apologize to God in my prayer journal, but I couldn't just write it out because my mom had a history of finding my writing and sending me to therapy over it. So I came up with a code. Dear Jesus, I'm sorry I mashed potatoes yesterday. I mashed a lot of potatoes. 
And despite us all being hormone-addled messes, the girls were tasked with being the gatekeepers, the goalies, the unassailable ones in the tower. And the boys were cast as spotless horn dogs who were only after one thing. After all, what else could a girl be good for? Oh, kids eventually, right. <laughs> and what are you at risk for trading your birthright away for? What would your stew be today, ladies and gentlemen? We're back in the gym. The letters stew pop up across the style on this large overhead screen. It's the same one we looked at to get the words for the songs during worship. The S was for sex. It's not super surprising. You are all princesses. And these beautiful shoes are kept in a beautiful castle. Your daddy, the king, Father God is keeping them safe for you, protecting them. And the cool thing is you can use these shoes anytime you want to. That's allowed. It's permitted. They are your shoes. You just have to go to your daddy and ask for them. Excuse me, um, could I have another Sprite, please? Stacy, don't do that! I'm, I'm still thirsty. You need to ask me first. I'm at a Mexican restaurant with my dad. I'm sure he was just worried about money. They declared bankruptcy pretty shortly after their divorce. But that rage that flashed over him, <laughs> it was a sight. I still can't order under pressure. Like, at a bar, if it's busy, forget it. The T is for technology. I know you all love being on AIM and ICQ and forums and whatever else you're doing on the World Wide Web. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Tyler knows, don't you? <laughs> it's funny now. God is watching, Tyler. I have to rehearse the order. And then I have to try to keep it in my head long enough to get the bartender's attention. I take a deep breath. And I just order my drink like a human being who has been doing this for approximately two decades. The E stands for entertainment. I know you all love your Marilyn Mansons. You idolize those R-rated movies you sneak into. You think we don't know about that? We do. Gin and tonic with a splash of lime. Gin and tonic with a splash of lime. Hey, uh, what can I get for you? Just a glass of red, please. Okay, hon, which one? Oh, shit! They're all in French! Okay, I got this. I took French. I've been to France. I've ordered wine in France. Just a glass of the house red. That would be great. W stands for weekends. You may be trading away your birthright because you want to sleep in on Sundays. Well, let me tell you this. You have to come to church, even if the game is on, even when you want to sleep in. Because if you succumb to that, one week will turn to two weeks. Two weeks may turn to a month. And then suddenly it's been a year since you've been in church. I don't know. I know you kids need to get your sleep, but I know if you want to find God's perfect will for your life, you need to be in this building every time the doors are open. And I'm just sitting in the audience, just internalizing everything. <sighs> Don't eat the stew. Don't eat the stew. Don't eat the stew. Coconut cream pie. All right, hon, can I uh, keep the tab open? Sure, that sounds great. I know I'm only getting one drink. I only have time for one drink. Why do I keep doing this? You can wear your shoes to school. Mm -hmm. You can wear them to soccer practice. You could even wear them to the mall. 
But if you just wear them on any old day, do you know what might happen? That's right, they might get dirty. Or you might step in the mud or some doggy poop. Oh, who knows? I think my dad only thanked me twice that I remember or that I know of. The first time it's this, it's this funny story he loves to tell. So let me tell you, when Stacy was about two or so, this was about the maddest I've ever been at her. It's Christmas and her mom, Beth, she got me this telescope and I wasn't sure I wanted it. It was orange with black hardware. It was cool telescope, but it wasn't really, it wasn't on my list. And I'm reading the manual and I look away for a second, a second. And Stacy just toddles over with her big old diaper and she reaches out her little tiny hand and she just grabs the styrofoam and the packaging. We can't return it now, can we? And I grabbed her and I just paddled her a little behind. I mean, God, I just, I, I just wasn't sure if I wanted it. Or if you do use your shoes early, maybe a strap will break so you'll get a little blister. Mommy, look, I'm in kindergarten or first grade and I'm holding this little coin bank made of cardstock you may not remember this, but Happy Meals used to have a lot of activities all over them, like word searches, mazes. And this one time, there was a little rectangular bank you could punch out and assemble. And I did it all by myself. And what do you do with a bank? You put some money in it, right? And now this dirty, broken shoe represents God's permissive will. He will allow you to make your own choices. Mommy, look, I made a bank. Oh, wow. Where did you get the quarter? I found it. Where did you find it, sweetheart? On the ground. Where did you really find it, Stacy? I got it out of daddy's drawer. Okay, when you want something, you have to ask one of us for it. Otherwise, that's stealing. You didn't get permission to get into your father's nightstand, and then you lied about it. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know you are, baby, but we are gonna have to tell daddy about this when he gets home. We love you too much to let you lie. So that was the second time. And it's tame compared to what so many of their peers did. It's tame compared to what they did to my brother. But I'm still so afraid of getting anything wrong because mistakes mean that you're either getting yelled at or you're going to hell, which is basically the same thing. If you ask for your shoes early, you'll be able to use them. God will still bless you. He will heal you and you will have a pretty nice life. But your choices mean that you will not get the fairy tale that you always wanted. And that's his perfect will, the fairy tale. Protect the shoe. Protect the shoe, protect the shoe. Suffice it to say, I didn't exactly keep the dick out of my shoe, um, but I did marry the first boy I ever went all the way with and followed him all the way to UC Berkeley. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. I got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart today. The year I transferred to Cal, one of the main stage shows was this devised work created by Joe Good, who is a name, and the students he selected. The audition notice was basically to just come in and get a little weird with a chair and I was overwhelmed with how Berkeley it all was. Is this communism? I am not in Bible school anymore. But that's a story for another day. 
and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart, and I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. I did not audition. All I remember about the piece they eventually put on was this person standing on a platform high above the stage. They're backlit in orange and red, and they just start screaming, anything can happen. And again, I am just overwhelmed by the Berkeleyness of it all. Hello, boys and girls. Thank you so much for singing along with me. Today, we're going to be talking about joy. Who can tell me what joy is? Having a puppy? Uh-huh. When your Grammy comes to visit? Oh, I like ice cream too, Tyler. But we're actually talking about something a little bit bigger than those things. Those things will make us feel happy for a little while. But joy is deep happiness inside that no one can ever take away. So how do we find joy? Anything can happen. Now, 20 years later, I get it. Anything can happen and anything does happen with alarming regularity. And some choose to deal with this existential dread by chucking the kiddos into Sunday school and putting themselves in the hands of an angry God. Because at least when I fear divine retribution, things make sense. There's a certain order, right? Cause and effect. If I am suffering, God is punishing me. And it just makes so much more sense than accepting that awful things happen arbitrarily and there's nothing we can do about it. Welcome to God's permissive will, folks. All right, kids. Do you see these letters behind me on the screen? They make a word. Can we read it together? Joy! And who can tell me what that first letter? It's a J. What do you think that letter stands for? That's right. It stands for Jesus. And what happened to Jesus? He died on the cross for our sins. But placing ourselves in the hands of an angry God is only tenable if there's an opportunity for relief, if there is grace, if Jesus is there to shield us from the wrath we deserve. But to love the grace is to accept the conceit of damnation. And to be saved by grace is by definition a confession of our own unworthiness. But what is worthiness? What is holiness? What is sin? What are sin? Well, every single lie we tell, or if we take something that doesn't belong to us, when we get angry with someone, or if we don't clean up our rooms when our parents tell us to, those are sins. Those are the things that Jesus died on the cross for. Jesus took the punishment we deserved for those sins. So if we really want to have joy, we need to be good little girls and boys and really consider what Jesus wants us to do before we do a single thing ever. And what happens when an adult is told they are unworthy? Perhaps they become angry or defensive. Perhaps it motivates them for a time in the way that shame can spur us for a mile or two before we collapse under its weight. And perhaps the adult can hopefully eventually say, you know what, this is bullshit and walk away. But the kids in the Sunday school, they can't make that decision. They can't walk away. The second letter, the O, that stands for others. After we consider what would make Jesus happy, because we don't want to hurt Jesus, do we? I said we don't want to hurt Jesus, do we? Okay, okay, good. So after we think about 
about what makes Jesus happy, we need to check what would make other people happy. So when our daddy asks us to do something and we do it right away, does that make him happy? Yeah, it does. And when you don't talk back to your mommy, does that make her happy? Yeah. And that is the most important thing, making others happy first. Children can't walk away when they're told they're fundamentally flawed. They can't walk away when they're told that demons are real and it's their job to fight them. They can't walk away when they're told the world is malevolent and unsafe. They can't walk away when they're told someone was tortured. When the horrors of that torture are fetishized, dramatized, ritualized, lauded. And they can't walk away when they're told that torture is what they actually deserve. They can't walk away when they're told that this is the ultimate expression of love. And the very last letter in the word joy, what do you see? That's right, it's a Y. And that stands for you. So every single decision you make, Every single action you take, I want you to make sure we're putting on our thinking caps and we're trying to make Jesus happy first, others happy second. And then after you've made everyone else in your life happy, you will find joy. It's simple. Jesus, others, you. Jesus, others, you. Jesus, others, you. Jesus, others, you. They can't walk away and eventually the shame and the guilt ossify. They become structural so that even when the musculature of belief fails, the bones remain stationary, inert. But directing the growth of every new muscle diverting the vasculature of new beliefs to keep the core intact. And the core is this. I am unworthy. I am flawed. It's all my fault. Don't eat the stew. Protect your shoe. Jesus, others, you. Don't eat the stew. Protect your shoe. Jesus, others, you. Don't eat the stew. Protect your shoe. Jesus, others, you. Don't eat the stew. Protect your shoe. Jesus, others, you. Don't eat the shoe. Protect your shoe. Eat Jesus, others, you. Don't eat the shoe to protect the shoe. Jesus, others. Anything can happen. Thank you very much for coming to the marsh tonight and thank you to the performers uh performers watch out for that uh invitation to the breakout room and uh good night everybody